Hi there, it's Jeff here again with another in our series of revision videos on key topics. This time let's spend a few minutes thinking about barriers to entry. Really important whenever you're discussing, analysing, evaluating monopoly and oligopoly in particular. So what are barriers to entry? Well, there any strategy which is designed to block a potential entrant from entering, entering a market and making a profit. It's basically a barrier to entry is anything designed to protect, maintain the market power, the monopoly power of existing firms, and crucially, therefore, allow those suppliers to continue to earn monopoly profit, supernormal profit in the long run. In other words, to, to maintain a high level of producer surplus. So basically, it's designed to make it difficult, costly, tough for new firms to enter the market. We'll go through some real world examples and some analysis, but e-commerce of scale is going to be a big part of this. Established firms that have been in the market for some time. They may have brought down their unit costs. They've got e-commerce of scale. They've got market intelligence. They've got uh, market know-how and now and understanding of processes. And of course, that can make it much harder for a new firm to enter a market because they don't have the same cost base. Product differentiation will be important if a firm has a unique product or unique service. It can be hard for new firms to copy it or produce something that's comparable at the same price. And in many industries, the fixed cost is a big barrier. So some industries require huge upfront investment. Uh, there might be some big research and development in pharmaceuticals, for example, or telecoms, or very specialised capital equipment, very expensive capital equipment, making it harder for new firms to enter. So here's some good examples. We're going to go through one or two um, in theory, a bit more detail, comms of scale, super important, in particular because it gives the existing firms a cost advantage. And there is a cost asymmetry, a cost imbalance between established and challenger businesses. Vertical integration, control of the supply chain, can also be treated as a barrier to entry. If you've got important control of key raw materials, components, from extraction and growing to the final consumer, that gives you more market control. Brand loyalty, of course, super important, because it brings down the price elasticity of demand for products and makes it harder to take sales and revenues off existing firms. Cost asymmetry, we'll come on to some more examples in a second. So cost asymmetry is when there's a difference in cost per unit between the incumbent firm, the established business, and potential entrants. So if the existing business businesses have managed to achieve substantial internal scale economies and brought down the long and average cost, they can they have the opportunity to cut prices when new suppliers enter the market. And this is one way we can show this using uh, cost and revenue curves. So I've, I've assumed here, I've, I've, taken, I've dropped the assumption of diminishing returns. I'm just drawing a constant cost curve. Marginal and average cost is the same. So each unit costs the same to make for the established firm. And that allows them to charge a profit maximising price shown there, uh, at output Q1. It may well be the case that existing, uh, sorry, new firms, the new entrant, has a higher cost level cost per units. So their cost could be higher, MC2 equals AC2. And that gap, that vertical distance, is the cost asymmetry or the cost advantage. Now linked with this is something called limit pricing. So limit pricing is when the incumbent firm essentially charges a lower price to deter, to block, the entry or the expansion of a fringe or a new firm. So the limit price will be below the profit maximising price, but above what we'd normally see in competition. Limit pricing represents a departure by firms from profit maximisation. They're prepared to sacrifice some profits in the short term to maintain their market position and therefore make more profit in the long run. So here's our diagram again. So there's our limit pricing analysis here. There's our gap between costs. Uh, they could set, for example, a limit price. So instead of charging uh, the high price, if they know what the costs of the competitor are, they may charge a limit price, shown there. Okay, They can still make some profit, although less than before. So then it's a movement away from profit maximisation. But it might be sufficient to inflict a loss on the new 
income, uh, the new rival firms, the new challenger businesses. So it's a sneaky tactic. OK, you set prices just low enough to discourage new firms from entering, but not so low that it sacrifices huge amounts of profit. So kind of barrier, but it's all about the cost advantage. Quite a defensive strategy. OK, it's the juggling act of pricing. Limit pricing is not illegal. Predatory pricing is the dark side of limit pricing. OK, so it's where a monopoly intentionally sets prices very low, so low below their cost of production uh, that they're willing to make a loss if it drives out a competitor from the business. So the goal, the aim is to reduce or eliminate competition and thereby gain, gain market share. Now, that is anti-competitive. Predatory pricing is anti-competitive. It's illegal in most countries. Increasingly, there are hefty fines and penalties, but it's very, very hard to prove because you've got to really know what the costs are of all the competing firms, both new and old, in the market. So limit pricing is more subtle than predatory pricing. Uh, it's not as obvious or aggressive. So do be aware of the difference between limit pricing and predatory pricing. Predatory pricing, pricing below average cost, possibly, or even lower than average variable cost in the short run. One or two other barriers to entry. Uh, control of platforms. So if you've got that vertical integration, again, Amazon Web Service, uh, uh, for example, one of the most profitable platform businesses in the world. Incredible control that Amazon has over lots of things. I think uh, expertise, goodwill and reputation is super important. I, I have my car service now at QuickFit and I've had done for the last 10 years. And my default is to go to QuickFit to get my car service because they're A, A they're very good, but they don't rip me off. They're accessible, they're affordable, uh, high quality. So expertise, good or reputation, uh, don't underestimate that as a barrier to entry in the market. And because we have all those legal protections as well, trademarks, copyright, patents, particularly important in oligopoly to have patented products to protect the property rights of your innovative process or product. Why are barriers to entry significant? Well, because they affect the concentration of markets in the long run. So if you have very high entry barriers and or exit costs, cost of leaving the market, then that makes a market less contestable and therefore more monopolistic. And if the existing firms have that market power, then it allows them to set price well above marginal and average cost. And price above marginal cost means a loss of allocative efficiency. And high barriers to entry... Uh, if it's really hard to break into a market, that might also damage both dynamic efficiency, might be less innovation, as well as productive efficiency, particularly if existing firms uh, allow their diseconomies to take over. Good example is the sportswear market. OK, so it's an oligopolistic industry. But we have seen in the UK in recent times some new firms coming in. The likes of Gymshark have been very successful. Uh, Castori, a uh, sports clothing firm that's making quite big strides at the moment. Clearly, you're up against the big players. It's competition in the land of the giants. Um, <laughs> Nike, Adidas, Puma, Under Armour now a major firm. Of course, they were once a challenger firm. So what are some of the barriers to entry if you're a new player in the sportswear market? Well, obviously, economies of scale. Because if you think about Nike and how they outsourced 95% of their manufacturing, it's all about scale to bring down the unit cost of production. Brand loyalty has to be overcome. When you have a lot of brand loyalty, you have a low cross price elasticity of demand. Strong brand loyalty uh, lowers the cross price elasticity of demand because consumers don't regard products as close substitutes anymore. And it increases the fixed cost of marketing needed to break in successfully into an industry. OK, that's why, by the way, it's easier to enter a market if you're already a well-known brand and you have scale. So about banking or whatever it is or something along those, along those lines, if you're already a big firm, it's probably easier to break into those kind of markets. And distribution channels, established brands, Nike and Adidas bring to mind, don't they? They have strong relationships with retailers, they have their own retail outlets. They are omni-channel businesses. They can sell through many, many different channels. 
it's very hard for new food and drink companies, for example, to to find to win or pay for the shelf space in in the leading supermarkets. So one of the brands that I've invested in is a sports nutrition business. And uh, we get a little thrill, we get a kick when we suddenly sign an agreement with Waitrose or with Marks and Spencers because it's super difficult to break into uh, those industries and find that literally get the shelf space from which you can then sell stock to consumers. Are barriers to entry in many markets coming down? I think the answer is in, in theory, yes. So there's a lot of interest in the role of new technology in shaking up traditional barriers to entry in some industries. If you think about online platforms, Uber, Airbnb have disrupted traditional industries by using technology to connect people and facilitate transactions. So the impact of Uber on the black cab market in London, the impact of Airbnb on the hotel sector, using, leveraging the power of online platforms to grow quickly. 3D printing, additive manufacturing. Uh, 3D printing makes it easy for small businesses to produce goods at lower cost. Okay, Cloud computing, and platform technologies have allowed many small firms uh, to use powerful computing resources at very low cost, leasing and subscribing rather than owning and developing. And in many ways, cloud computing services have given small businesses a, a new lease of life because they provide new distribution channels as well as cutting their computing costs. It helps to level the playing field and therefore brings down the barriers to entry. So uh, other, other reasons. Uh, lean startups. So a lot of businesses now, there's been a move towards trying to break into a market with a minimum viable product. Uh, Eric Ries wrote a very famous book on lean startups. So try, if you're going to break into a market, break in there at the lowest feasible cost. Don't spend lots of money, just get a simple, basic product into the market, get the consumer feedback, develop it, an iterative process and see if you can survive. A lot of businesses are prepared to enter markets with different pricing models, perhaps based on algorithmic pricing. A lot of businesses have managed to successfully cut the marketing costs through viral marketing, social media. Gymshark and Depop have been very successful. Many businesses now lease rather than buy equipment. So the rise of pop-up retailers is a good example. The availability of open source software has cut the costs for businesses. And lots of businesses now rely on flexible manufacturing. Okay, so in my business that I've invested in is a sports nutrition business. Okay, you don't necessarily need your own factory to make these bars and powders and drinks. What you need to find is other food producers, food manufacturers who've got spare factory capacity, which you can then essentially subscribe to or fill the gaps in their capacity and start producing in those gaps. All of these ideas, so I think of why businesses are trying to overcome some of the barriers to entries in markets. And if they can do that, and if the barriers to entries are coming down, then a market becomes less contestable. Well, I hope you found this video useful. Hopefully it's covered some good examples of barriers to entry. Key concepts there, economies of scale, uh, limit pricing, and predatory pricing. Those are really three ones for you to take away from this. Take care, and uh, hope to see you all soon.